Amen. Thank you so much, Judy and Harry. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. That's why we're here this morning, because the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, born in that stable in Bethlehem with a purpose, with a mission, ultimately, that he might go to the cross of Calvary there, die on that cross for your sins and for my sins. This morning, as we enter into this time of Christmas season, as we look around and we see the sights and the sounds of Christmas, uh, we can't help to get excited. I don't know about you, but uh, Christmas time is one of the most exciting times of the year where folks are a little more open to the message that we have to proclaim about that joy that comes in and through Jesus Christ. But you look around, you see the sights and the sounds. Now, I, I will tell you, if we had real poinsettias, if we had a real Christmas tree, there would be another sense that would kick in. We would smell Christmas as well. You see, smell is one of the most heightened senses. We smell, and maybe that smell brings you back to your childhood, and you smell the cookies that your grandma was cooking in the kitchen. And maybe you smell that Christmas tree that you had when you were growing up, those smells of Christmas, and so it's the sights, and the sounds, and the smells. Smells are, are powerful things for, for both good and bad, as we'll see this morning. Uh, we went into a GameStop on uh, 17, kind of west, uh, about three miles down on 17 near the Petco and, and the Giant on Friday night. We didn't fight the crowd on Friday morning or Thursday night, but it wasn't too bad, and we, we walked into the GameStop. And you figure you walk into an establishment, you walk into a store like that, and you expect to just kind of walk in. We walked in, we opened the door, and immediately, that's a bad smell. And I kid you not, right? It smelled like a sewer. That, that's really not, you know, on Black Friday in particular, that's really not the smell that you're going for if you really want to have people come into your business. So we, we kind of dealt with it, and we're just like, man, that smell is really overpowering. I want to share with you this morning as we begin, and, and why, why I'm sharing this 10 fun facts about smell. Go ahead and be turning to 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, as we look this morning about the aroma of Christ. But 10 things maybe you knew, maybe you didn't know about smell. Number one, everyone has a unique odor identity similar to a fingerprint. No two people smell the same way except identical twins. I, I didn't know, I've never heard, I heard about the fingerprint, never heard about the smell. Number two, the human brain can process roughly 10,000 different smells in the area the size of a postage stamp. Wow, that's a lot of smelling for a real small space. Number three, I knew I did not have to have them tell me. I, I knew this. Men, if you've been married for any length of time, you know this. If you're in a relationship, you know this. Women's smell is much stronger than men's smell. Okay, I, got, I did get an amen in the early service. I got an amen back there. Because you will know this from experience, men. When you walk in somewhere, even if you're in your house, wherever you are, and your wife said, do you smell that? And you go, no. <laughs> now, now let's be, how many of you have had your wife that, do you smell that? And let's be honest, and you go, no, I really don't. Okay, we got a couple, we got a couple, wives, women smell much stronger than men smell. So now you know, when she smells something you don't, it's legitimate, it's scientific, there's a reason. Number four, a uh, person's sense of smell is weakest in the morning, and the ability to perceive odor increases throughout the day. Number five, approximately 80% of what we taste is actually qualified by our sense of smell. This is why our taste is diminished during a cold or a flu. Number six, prolonged exposure to unpleasant smells can actually impair your ability to smell. And wearing a mask over the nose and mouth can help lessen the effects of malodors. Number seven, smell has a very powerful link to memory. 
and links to the emotional regions of the brain more directly than the other senses. Number eight, our sense of smell is strongest in the spring and summer because of the added moisture in the air. It is also stronger after exercising because of the additional moisture in the nasal cavity. It's also stronger when somebody else has been exercising around you and they walk past you. That's a different thing. Number nine, now, scent works in the opposite direction of other senses. With sight, sounds, and taste, we identify the information first, and then we react emotionally. With sense, we have an emotional reaction first, and then we identify the scent shortly thereafter. And number 10, people can remember smells with 65% accuracy after a year, while visual recall is about 50% after a year just three months. Someone once said that a pleasant scent can signal powerful memories that bring us back to a great experience, while a disagreeable odor can be offensive. Folks, this morning, whether you realize it or not, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are the aroma, the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Not just at Christmas time, but every single day, but particularly at Christmas time, we have an opportunity to be the fragrance, the aroma of Christ to a folk in need who will be more open to what we have to share with them depending on how we smell. And so I asked this morning, and I'll ask again at the end, how do you smell this morning? Not did you put your deodorant on, not did you put your aftershave or perfume on, there you go, but how do you smell for Jesus Christ? If you have your copy of God's Word and are able to stand this morning, 2 Corinthians Uh, Chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. The Apostle Paul writing that when he came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. In other words, the Apostle Paul knew that he was called to Troas to preach the gospel. He was there, but the circumstances he found himself in there at Troas were such that he got discouraged. His, his good friend, his protege in the faith, Titus, was not there in Troas. He was expecting him to be there. He got discouraged. He got downcast. And then he ended up going to Macedonia. But, but notice between verse 13 and verse 14, the complete change and shift that the Apostle Paul had in his thinking. But thanks be to God, who in Christ, we'll come back to that in Christ, it's important throughout this passage of Scripture, those two small words, but yet they make all the difference in the world in Christ, always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And then Paul asked this question. It's a question that we ask ourselves even this morning. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God in the sight of of God, we speak, and there's those two words again, we speak in Christ. Father, we thank you this morning that we are commissioned by you. We are a sent people, and we go in your name to speak on your behalf, uh, to spread the knowledge of you through our aroma, through our life, through our words, through our witness. Father, this morning, uh, we pray that you would help us to enhance the fragrance and the aroma of Christ. If there's anything in our life that is masking that, if there's anything in our life that is detracting from that, Father, might we repent, might we set it aside, and might we be the aroma of Christ that you have called us to be wherever our feet might take us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, Folks, at Christmas time, 
People are more open to the gospel of Jesus Christ than just about any other time of the year. People will be open to you inviting them to come to a Christmas musical. Oh, they may not come to a regular service, but I would encourage you, invite them to come to the Christmas musical in two weeks. They'll come, invite them to come at Christmas Carol. Invite them to come to a Christmas Eve candlelight service. They may not come to a regular service on Sunday morning, but folks are more open than at any other time of the year. But as the Apostle Paul shares here, uh, we have an opportunity to be the fragrance, the aroma of Jesus Christ. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter the circumstances of life that we find ourselves in, and maybe you're here at the end of 2017, and that's kind of just anybody else kind of just mind blown. The end of 2017, where'd the year go? Where it's it's gone. It's going to be 2018 before we know it, unless the Lord comes again. It it just it's gone. And maybe you're here this morning, and maybe. Your week hasn't gone the way you had planned. Maybe your month hasn't gone the way you had planned. For some of you, 2017, you're ready to turn the page because 2017 as a year just hasn't gone the way that you had planned. See, the Apostle Paul had planned to go to Troas to preach the gospel. He knew that he was called to preach the gospel there. When he got there, Titus, his good friend, his brother in the faith, wasn't there. He became discouraged. And and I don't know about, you know, I I love Paul, but I I identify more with the Apostle Peter. The the Apostle Peter, he's like, and I'm going to date myself, he's like Horshack from Welcome Back, Cotter. He's like... You know, when Jesus says, well, who do you say that I'm? Oh, I, I, I got this. I know. I know who it is. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Yes, right answer. But then it wasn't too much later after that, was it? Hey, you're, you're one of those Galileans. You, you're with Jesus. <laughs> I've never heard of Jesus. No, no, you, you must be. Yeah, I know you. No. you you're mistaken. I, I No, I know that. And then he began to curse. No way, I don't know the man. See, he was was up on the mountaintop, even on the mountain transfiguration. And he was down in the valley. See, the Apostle Paul, we, we get this impression that he was just, you know, whatever hit him, he was just like solid, steady. But here, I think, going to Troas just kind of threw him for a loop. Just for a moment. We just get just appear into to what's going on in the Apostle Paul's life and we get the Holy Spirit to have the Apostle Paul to write it down, to preserve it so that we can see. He just, man, my spirit just wasn't there. My buddy Titus wasn't there. And he, for just, maybe just a brief moment between verses 13 and verses 14, Paul threw himself We've done this before. He threw himself, what, a, a pity party? This is, not, this is not the circumstance of life that I, I thought 2017 would be. This is not what I thought would be happening in my life right now. This is not just for that brief moment. We peer into Paul and understand that Paul was human like us. Paul struggled like us. And that circumstance of life, maybe you're Right now, you're going, I just, I I don't know why 2017 didn't turn out the way that I had planned. And then a shift. I think Paul comes to himself, or more accurately, he comes to Jesus. And Jesus maybe had to come to Jesus meeting with Paul. And there's a shift, almost on a dot, so, so quick, it'll make your head spin from verse 13 to verse 14. But, it's not the way that I planned it. It's not what I thought would happen to Troas. It's not, not the way that, that I envisioned things going. It's not what I thought would happen in 2017. It's not what I, I thought would happen in my marriage. It's not what I thought would happen with my kids. It's not what I thought would happen at my job. It's not what I thought would happen at my workplace. It's not what I thought would happen with my health. It's just not what I thought would happen. But, but thanks be to God, 
who in Christ, here's that word. I like that word. That word's there for a purpose, for a reason. Who always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. He always leads us in triumphal procession. In other words, in Christ, we march victoriously because he secured the victory. The Apostle Paul, he uses this picture that we may not quite understand, although if we look at the world around us and we see certain regimes today, North Korea and Iran and certain dictatorships, we see this procession going through the open courtyard. That's exactly what Paul was thinking about in terms of the Roman army when they came back into the city after scoring a great victory, they would march in triumphal procession. And as part of that march, there would be censers that would be letting out incense, and the smell of victory would be there. There would also be flowers that would line the way. And as the horses would gallop over those flowers, they would let out a scent. And so the whole city smelled a victory. There was a certain smell. There was an aroma. But yet even within the procession of victory, there were there some who had been captured in battle. And those who were captured in battle were not marching through the streets heading to a life of ease in Rome. They were no marching through the streets ready to meet their certain death at the hands of the Romans, some for life, some for death. And so the Apostle Paul paints this picture of the smell, the fragrance, the aroma of the procession of triumph. Folks, understand this morning in Christ we march victoriously, triumphantly. But that victory is not ours. That victory is not won by us, but that victory is Jesus Christ, and the victory is won by Him and what He did on the cross of Calvary. And the cross of Calvary was made possible because of Christmas. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son the greatest gift that could ever be given, the greatest gift that could ever be received. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him, has faith in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, our victory comes in and through Jesus Christ and Christ alone and what He did through His life, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension, and His coming again in glory. It's not about us, as Pastor John reminds us. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. And the victory is His. And we march in triumph because of what He did. But we march in triumph by faith. By faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. You're here this morning. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you know Him by faith. You know Him because of God's amazing grace. But it is by faith, as John reminds us in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes or has faith that Jesus is the Son of God? He is who He says He is. He's done what He said He would do. Our victory comes in and through faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. This morning, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, He has secured your victory. He has secured your victory over sin, over Satan, and yes, even over death itself. But it is by faith this morning. But if you're here this morning, you're a Christian. You say, I know that I have faith in Christ. I know that I'm born again. I know that I know that I have salvation Our victory also comes when we trust on a day-to-day basis what Jesus Christ has for us. We trust Him not just as Savior, but we trust Him as Lord. We trust Him when things are not going well. 
We trust him like the Apostle Paul. When we cannot understand why in the world he would have come to Troas and his good buddy Titus wasn't there, and now he moved on to Macedonia. We trust him when this past week didn't go well. We trust him when this past month didn't go well. We trust him when this past year didn't go well. We trust him when the job didn't go well. We trust him when the finances aren't going well. We trust him when the marriage is not going well. We trust him when the kids are not going well. We trust him when the health is not going well. And in the midst of that, we keep on trusting God because he always leads us in triumphal, victorious procession. We march with him. The writer of Proverbs put it this way, perhaps in a proverb that you know by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In most of your ways... Is that how it reads? In all your ways. In all your ways. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall make straight your path. Because he's a good, good father. Perfect in all of his ways. Folks, this morning, we march victoriously. But it's by faith. And it's by a day-to-day trust that our God knows what is best for us. Even when we don't understand that he always knows where we need to go. What we need to do in this life. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. He leads us in triumphal procession. He leads us to march victoriously when we're in Christ. But folks, understand there's a warning. Outside of Christ, there is no victory. And outside of Christ, on the other side, in eternity, all roads will lead to separation and death in a very real place called hell. Folks, understand this morning that in Christ we have victory. In Christ we have victory over sin, over Satan, and over death itself. But outside of Christ, we simply do not have that guarantee. And in fact, the proverb writer in Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 says this, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Folks, there are a lot of people that think, I, I got this all figured out. I, I'm going my own way. I'm marching my own, my own path. Folks, this morning, the worst thing that could ever be said about any person The worst thing that really could be said about a Christian is simply this. Hey, you know, that they march to the beat of their own drummer. Folks, when we come to Christ, we give up our drums. When we come to Christ, we, we march to his beat. When we come to Christ, we go where he wants us to go. When we come to Christ, we follow him. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Folks, this morning, who's leading you? Is it Christ or is it someone else? Are you leading yourself? Are you choosing your own path? Are you going your own way? Are you marching to the beat of your own drummer? Or are you following Jesus Christ in triumphal procession? Are you marching victoriously behind him where he wants you to go, are you trusting him that he'll always, even when you can't understand, that he'll always take you exactly where you need to be? Folks, who are you trusting this morning? Who are you following? Who's leading you? Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. 
Folks, we march victoriously in Christ. But notice what Paul says here about us being a fragrance and being an aroma. In Christ, we live powerfully. For Christ uses us powerfully everywhere we go, wherever our feet might take us. We are spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Whether it's right here in Stafford County, or whether you get on a plane tonight at Dulles or BWI and you fly across the pond, wherever we go, uh, we are spreading the fragrance of Christ, the knowledge of Him, the knowledge of His gospel, the knowledge of what it means to be saved. We are sharing with folks everywhere we go through our life, through our words, through our actions, through our attitudes, everywhere we go. We are the aroma of Christ. And we can either enhance that aroma or we can mask that. We can enhance it by how we live, by our grace-filled lives. We can enhance it by our, our unconditional love. And we must enhance it, even in our culture today that that does not want this third one to be a part of what we do, but we must enhance it with biblical truth, the truth of who God is, the truth of who Jesus Christ is. In a culture that is rapidly running away from who God is, we must continue to be loving, we must continue to be grace-filled, but at the same time, we must continue to be truthful and to model that truth. It is only when we do all three of those, we will not do them perfectly, but when we do them consistently, that we will enhance the aroma of Jesus Christ to a world that is lost and in need of salvation. But so often, there are Christians, there are churches, And in our day, there are whole denominations in the United States and around the world that are simply not enhancing the aroma of Jesus Christ, but they are masking that with a smell that will lead to death. Now, folks, don't misunderstand. The gospel itself will always be an offense. The gospel itself will always be a stumbling block. But we should never ourselves as Christians become a stumbling block. We should as Christians never be an offense. We should as Christians never mask the aroma of Jesus Christ by what we do or what we say. And there are three ways this morning that we can simply mask the aroma of Jesus Christ. They all start with H, so you can remember these. First is hypocrisy. Saying one thing and doing the opposite. Non-Christians believe that Christians are just hypocrites, then people will eventually only smell our hypocrisy and will never smell the aroma of Christ and the gospel. That is the number one knock against the church today. Folks, make no mistake, we are all hypocrites from time to time. There's not a single one of us in here that does not wear the mask. And that's really what it is to to put on a mask, to act differently than what you really are. And so there's not a single one of us. And maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's just a small bit of hypocrisy. Maybe you walked in this morning and somebody asked you how you were doing. And your immediate response was, well, I'm good. I'm fine. And inside you were like, I'm not good, I'm not fine, I don't want to be here, I don't want to see anybody, I, I, I feel horrible, I feel lousy, but somebody asked you how you're, I'm doing good, brother. Woo, bless the Macarios, woo, I'm doing great. And you walk away and you go, I didn't want to come, I didn't want to be here. So we, all, we all struggle from time to time with the sin of hypocrisy. But might it never become the defining characteristic of our life? For you see, when it does, the non-believer will see that and they will never then smell the aroma of Christ and the gospel. The second way that we mask the aroma of Christ is through hubris. Hubris? It's really an exaggerated pride or self-confidence. You say, Pastor, I... I'm not proud. I, you know, I had a minister that, that I served with in New Mexico. He used to say this, I, I'm too humble to be proud. Some of you get that after lunch. Too humble to be proud. See, it, it, it's, a, it's an exaggerated pride. It's a self-confidence. And, and people see that. And basically what it says is, I, I really don't need I, Jesus. I got it covered. I'm good. I, 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 can, I can handle life Monday through Saturday. I got a good Sunday. I'll come for an hour or two. I, I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm good the rest of the time. 
It's a self-confidence, and it really it's an exaggerated pride in what we can do because we forget that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. But we live life as, we, as if we could do it all. And when the non-believer sees our life and sees our hubris and sees that exaggerated pride and that self-confidence and that we really don't need Jesus, then why should they need Jesus either? But if we live every day as beggars, seeking more grace, if we live every day in need, I need thee, what every hour we sing, that every hour I need thee. Not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Hypocrisy, hubris, the last is heresy. When we simply don't have the right beliefs, and not only do we not have the right beliefs, we begin to teach the wrong beliefs. The, the Church of Sweden didn't know that there was really a church in Sweden anymore, and, and there really is not for all practical purposes. But this, this last week, the, the church in Sweden gave the directive to their ministers and their clergy that they, that they want to be a little more inclusive in, in the church, and so they should really stop referring to God as Father or Lord. Now, I, I'm not sure what they do with the, the Lord's Prayer. Our, our parent, who is not sure what we do, this is my beloved child, father, son, and well, how, see when heresy slips in to the church and it slips in so often unawares because it's untethered to Scripture. And then when heresy comes in, you think, I'm just being loving. I'm just being inclusive. I'm just, I, want, I want to embrace everybody. But the odor that you give off is not the aroma of Christ. It's actually an odor of death. Little do you know it. Folks, this morning, Christ and his gospel will smell differently to different people. For those who are being saved, it is that life-giving aroma. For those who are perishing, it is a smell of death. Folks, if we've not masked that smell, we have a wonderful opportunity, not just at Christmas, but throughout the year, uh, to share the love of Jesus Christ. Is your life a powerful smell this morning, enhancing the aroma of Christ through your life, through your words, through your actions, through your attitudes, or are you masking the aroma of Christ through your hypocrisy, hubris, or heresy? Ask the Lord to help you to set those aside and to enhance the aroma of Christ. For when we do, uh, we get to speak persuasively in Christ's name. We get to speak persuasively in Christ's name. Uh, Paul says at the end of Verse 16, who is sufficient for these things? Folks, none of us are sufficient. In and of ourselves, we absolutely have no sufficiency. I, I can't do what I do. You cannot teach. You cannot serve. You cannot share your faith. You cannot live out the Christian life in, in our own power because we have no power of ourselves. But when we are weak, he is strong and the power of Christ rests upon us. And he is sufficient because we are simply not. But when we realize that who is sufficient for these things, oh, I am not, but Jesus Christ is in Christ and in Christ alone. But we are made sufficient through him. And we are sincere for Christ, free from hypocrisy and from hubris and from heresy, so that we might be sent by Christ. For we are commissioned, as it says here in the end of verse 17, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. I don't know what to say. In Christ, he'll tell you what to say. I, I, I've, never, I've never shared my faith that way. I, I'm not sure I can. In Christ, you can. You may not ever know where the words came from, but in that very moment, in Christ, he gives you the strength, and he gives you the power, and he gives you the words to say. But it's in Christ Jesus this morning. Folks, we have a message to proclaim. We have a commission to fill. Folks, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you have been commissioned. We are in the Lord's army. And folks, there's only one way, well, two actually, to get out of that commission. 
One is when Jesus Christ comes again. He says, that's it. We're done. The only other way is when you PCS out of here, up to heaven. But until then, we're all just TDY. One day, and that day getting sooner and sooner, we'll, we'll be ready to go. But folks, until that day, we have a gospel to proclaim. We, we have a smell to give off. It's the aroma of Christ. I told you about the GameStop on Friday night. Brenda and I went back on Saturday afternoon to that very same GameStop. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Figure, it, it's not been quite 24 hours, but it's been a lot. It's been overnight, and it's been all morning. And, you know, I just opened the door like I'm going to walk in like nobody's business. And I walked in the door, and I, man, it still stinks. Just, it was there. It was, it was lingering. Kind of like the, the BBO in Jerry Seinfeld's car, that one. It just clung to everything. Just, you know, good and bad odors, they, they have a tendency to cling. What odor are you giving off? You see, it'll linger for good or for bad a lot longer than you think it will. We, the sons and daughters of the king, we are the aroma of Christ, for those who are being saved and for those who are perishing. This morning, might we enhance that aroma through our life? Might we ask the Lord to take away whatever would mask His aroma? And at the end of the day, hey Lord, how am I smelling today? Is it a smell that smells like Jesus? Or is the smell that smells like us? How do you smell? How do you smell? Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning that we are the aroma of Christ. That in Christ, that you have given us victory. In Christ, through our faith, we march in triumphal procession. Father, I pray this morning if there's anyone here who is not in Christ who has never confessed their sin, who has never repented and turned to Jesus Christ in faith and received Him as Savior and Lord. Father, this morning I pray that today would be the day that they would know the victory that has been secured for them on the cross of Calvary. Might Your Spirit open their hearts and minds to draw them to the cross into the empty tomb, made possible because of your great love that Jesus came, born that he might die. Father, I pray for Christians this morning who are in Christ, but maybe this past week, maybe this past month, maybe this past year has just not been going the way they planned, and they need to trust you today. For you know the plans that you have for them, plans for good, to give them a future and a hope, plans in and through Jesus Christ. And Father, might you give them the grace to trust you more today. And Father, as we go out this Christmas season, Father, give us the boldness, give us the courage to speak persuasively to those that we meet about the life-transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are open now more than ever. Might we take advantage of those opportunities? Father, speak to us this morning. Use us. Might we respond to you this morning in Jesus' name.